it's Margot, and today I'm continuing my series on the unfortunate endings of far too many of Playboy's models, a phenomenon that's been dubbed the centerfold curse or the Playboy curse. I'm sure you won't want to miss this one, so keep watching. Many of the deaths of the women who have posed for Playboy have been gruesome, premature, and shrouded in mystery. These deaths have spanned nearly six decades, from 1962 until the most recent in 2020. There have been no less than 20 Playboy centerfolds that have died before the age of 50, though if this is indeed a curse, it's not limited to centerfolds. These are two more of the tragic stories of women affiliated with Playboy whose lives were prematurely ended by murder. Jasmine Fiore was born Jasmine Lepore in 1981 and was raised in Bonnie Doon, California. Growing up, she liked playing football and worked for a local grocery store. She's been described as a kind, wholesome girl next door. Jasmine was a swimsuit model who frequently worked as a body-painted entertainer at events and in shows at Las Vegas casinos. She'd acted in commercials for bathing suits and adult phone lines. She was also featured in an advertisement for radio host Howard Stern. While Jasmine was a model, she worked for Playboy Enterprises for about a year, promoting sporting events, and in the film Girls in Golf. Contrary to popular misconception, she never actually posed for the magazine. Following her death, there was a brief internet obsession with finding nude pictures of her that's frankly rather disturbing. As far as anyone is aware of, there are no nude photos of her to be found. In fact, two years prior to her death, Jasmine had given up modeling and legally changed her last name to Kincaid to separate herself from her past. Since that time, she'd also earned her real estate license and was planning to open a gym. Jasmine was a beautiful lady with a seemingly bright future, but like so many others before and since, all of that was taken away in an instant. And like so many others, it all started with falling in love with the wrong asshole. Jasmine had a long-time on-again, off-again relationship with a Las Vegas real estate agent named Robert Haspin. It seemed she wanted to settle down with him, but ultimately that didn't work out. From interviews Robert gave after Jasmine's death, it's obvious he still felt protective of her. Another notable relationship was with Travis Heinrich, whom Jasmine met around 2005. They were even engaged to be married for less than six months in 2006 or 2007. Although they broke off this engagement, they continued to date for a while afterward. Jasmine seemingly had a habit of staying friendly with her exes. Megan Wants a Millionaire was a spinoff of the VH1 dating. I hesitate to say reality because it's using the term very loosely. But it was a spin-off of a dating shit show called Rock of Love, starring Brett Michaels. These shows were sort of like The Bachelor, just as ridiculous and unbelievable, but, well, possibly even more ridiculous. Anyway, Megan Wants a Millionaire only aired for one season, but one of the contestants was a 32-year-old Canadian real estate investor named Ryan Jenkins, who'd also been a contestant and ultimately the winner on another ridiculous VH1 show called I Love Money. Unfortunately, 28-year-old Jasmine met Jenkins at a Las Vegas casino shortly after he finished filming Megan Wants a Millionaire. Just two days later, on March 18, 2009, the two were married at the Little White Wedding Chapel on the Vegas Strip. According to court records, Jenkins was charged three months later in June of 2009 in Clark County, Nevada, with battery constituting domestic violence for hitting Jasmine on the arm. Jasmine's ex, Travis Heinrich, who was present at the time of the assault, said the couple were arguing over Jasmine kissing him, Heinrich, and Jenkins hit Jasmine's arm, causing her to fall into a nearby swimming pool. Lisa Lepore, Jasmine's mother, has also claimed that the couple fought frequently and that Jenkins was jealous of Jasmine's continuing friendships with her ex-boyfriends. Ms. Lepore has also stated that her daughter had actually had her marriage to Jenkins and Ault in May of 2009, 
but there are no court records of the annulment in either Nevada, where the couple was married, or Los Angeles County, where they resided. Jenkins was scheduled to go on trial for the June incident of violence in December of 2009. Nevertheless, the couple reconciled and were traveling to San Diego for a poker tournament that August. It was a charity fundraiser for the Karma Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to improving the lives of disadvantaged women. The couple checked into Lobage Hotel in Del Mar, San Diego on the evening of August 13, 2009. Then they went to the Del Mar Hilton for the tournament. An anonymous tournament attendee later told ABC News, Jasmine was playing poker with a big group of friends at the Hilton Hotel. She was being very rude and kept putting Ryan down. It was really awkward. She has a cutting sense of humor. He was getting really angry and it totally set the tone for the rest of the evening. Surveillance video captured Jasmine and Jenkins leaving the tournament at about 12.30 a.m. on August 14th. They then went to the Ivy Hotel, a nightclub in downtown San Diego, for drinks with friends from the poker tournament. The same anonymous attendee recounted, She spent an enormous amount of time in the bathroom on the phone. Ryan started asking who she was on the phone with, and she said her mom. It was 12.30 at night, and she was not on the phone with her mom. He kept screaming, Who were you talking to? At about 1.30, they went back to their room to continue fighting. According to Jasmine's ex, Robert Hassman, she'd been texting with him that night, saying she wanted to leave Jenkins and was considering traveling to Las Vegas to visit Hassman. Her last text to him was sent in the early morning of August 14th and simply said, I'm coming. Hassman has said he assumes that may have been the motive for Jasmine's murder. At around 4.30 that morning, Jenkins returned to their hotel alone. Jasmine wasn't seen alive again. Jenkins checked out of the hotel at around 9 a.m. that day. Jasmine's body was discovered by a local man digging through trash for recyclables on August 15th at about 7 a.m. She'd been brutally beaten, strangled, stripped naked, and crammed into a suitcase, which was found blood-soaked in a dumpster in an alley in Buena Park, California. Her teeth and fingers had been removed. Authorities believe the mutilation was an attempt to delay identification which it certainly did. On August 18th, her remains were finally identified using the serial numbers from her breast implants. The Orange County Coroner's Office reported Jasmine had died a couple hours before her body was found. Her white Mercedes was found abandoned in a parking lot in West Hollywood, about a mile from the penthouse she'd shared with Jenkins. Police reported that there was a significant amount of blood in Jasmine's car, and some evidence of hair pulling. Jenkins had reported Jasmine missing on August 15th at 8.55 p.m. He told police he'd last seen her at about 8.30 p.m. August 14th at their home in Los Angeles. He claimed they'd gone to San Diego for the poker event and that after returning, she dropped him off that evening, left to do errands, and never returned. At around 9 a.m. on August 16th, the day after reporting Jasmine missing and after spending some time packing, Jenkins was seen leaving their penthouse for the last time. He then left Los Angeles and went to Nevada to pick up his speedboat. On August 17th, when contacted by police, Jenkins said he was in Utah on his way to Canada to resolve some immigration issues. On August 18th, Jasmine's body was identified and the murder first reported. On the afternoon of August 19th, Jenkins called his father from Birch Bay, Washington, who informed him Jasmine had been found murdered. Police later found Jenkins' BMW SUV and an empty boat trailer at a marina in Blaine, Washington. The engine was still warm. At that time, Jenkins was only a person of interest in the investigation. He hadn't been charged, but Canadian authorities had been alerted to watch out for him. On August 19th, a man matching Jenkins' description was seen piloting his boat into a marina in Point Roberts, Washington, where Jenkins' stepmother lived. On August 20th, Jenkins was charged with Jasmine's murder, and an arrest warrant was issued. Also on August 20th, Jenkins called his detained father at the airport, but his father had to hang up the call. At about 6 p.m. on August 20th, 
Jenkins arrived in a silver PT cruiser with a young blonde woman at the Thunderbird Motel in Hope, British Columbia, Canada. Jenkins stayed in the car while the young woman paid cash for three nights accommodation. This mystery woman turned out to be his half-sister Elena. She stayed in Jenkins' room for about 20 minutes, then left the motel. The motel manager saw Jenkins walking around outside the next day, on August 21st. He said Jenkins looked exhausted and wasn't recognizable from his picture on television. On August 23rd, Jenkins neglected to check out of the motel. The motel's manager and his nephew decided to check the room and found Jenkins' lifeless body hanging from a clothes rack by a belt. No suicide note was left behind, but police found a document saved on Jenkins' computer titled Last Will and Testament, dated August 20th, 2009. Following the announcement that Jenkins was connected with the murder of Jasmine, VH1 put Megan Wants a Millionaire on indefinite hiatus out of respect for Jasmine's family. It also deleted the show's page from the official VH1 website and dropped reruns of past shows from its schedule. It removed the show's archived episodes from the iTunes store and cable video on-demand services. The day after Jenkins' death, VH1 officially announced the show was cancelled and that it wouldn't run the third season of I Love Money, which Jenkins had won. Following Jasmine's murder, it was discovered that Jenkins had been convicted two years earlier for assaulting a woman in Canada and sentenced to 15 months probation. That had never been disclosed to VH1 or, as far as anyone knows, to Jasmine. Jasmine is remembered as a kind, generous, loving, beautiful person who certainly didn't deserve the end she came to. And in my opinion, Ryan Jenkins deserves far worse than the end that came to him. Known for her beautiful olive skin and green eyes, Christina Carlin Craft was a small town girl from New Jersey, born on November 11, 1983, to Don Ann Carlin and Stuart Craft. Her mother died prematurely at the age of 30, so Christina and her brother Brian were raised by her father and stepmother, Casey. Christina also had two younger half-siblings. She remained very close with her family until her death. Christina was a very successful model, and she was Playboy's Cyber Girl of the Week for the week of May 4, 2009. Her modeling profile read, in Christina's own words, I've done runway shows, print work, commercials for jewelry and evening gowns, and I did a tasteful photo shoot for Playboy that was beyond Hollywood glamour. She stated that she wanted to work with creative photographers who specialize in glamour and very high fashion, and said, I really do enjoy photo shoots for swimwear and tasteful lingerie. I'm willing to travel, and I love to meet new, exciting people with high energy and a kind heart. Her modeling credits included working for Victoria's Secret, Vanity Fair, Maxim, David Yerman, and Matt Cosmetics. Christina was recently engaged to her longtime boyfriend, 43-year-old New York-based Wall Street banker Alex Ciccatelli Jr., who she dated for 14 years. By all accounts, Christina and Alex appeared to be a very happy couple, and Alex seemingly loved her dearly. In August of 2018, Alex had recently bought a condo in an upscale neighborhood in Ardmore in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for Christina to live in when they weren't at their beach house in Margate, New Jersey. According to neighbors, Christina had only lived at the condo for a week or two prior to her death. Christina's carefully crafted public image was that of glamour and class, but she did have a troubling history of engaging in controversy and even initiating violence. For a while, Christina lived a life of luxury in New York City, dining at top restaurants and enjoying the city's nightlife with friends. However, in 2016, she was arrested and charged with misdemeanor assault, attempted assault, and harassment when she had a violent altercation with Sergei Anakin, the manager of an upscale New York City restaurant called The Smith, on Manhattan's Upper West Side. Christina was alleged to have punched Mr. Anakin in the back and kicked him in the groin, causing him substantial pain. This took place after Christina and a male companion had refused to pay their bill for unknown reasons. Prosecutors later agreed to drop the charges on the condition that Christina stay out of trouble for the next six months, which she did. Christina was intoxicated at the time of the altercation and claimed the manager had pushed her. 
A video of the incident later determined that claim to be a lie. Unfortunately, getting drunk and belligerent appears to have been a nasty habit for Christina, at least according to allegations made by an Ardmore bar manager. Of course, we should always take anonymous allegations with a grain of salt. This manager told the press that Christina had actually been in a bar fight just one week before her murder. He's quoted as saying, One regular, an old guy, about 80 years old, owned some restaurants in Philly and was here with a buddy. He was super outgoing, the kind of guy who talked up everyone. He was chatting it up with some ladies, along with his friend, when Christina walked in. They bought her a drink. He then said that Christina soon got into an argument with the group. He said she lashed out and started stealing drinks from the man. Then she grabbed the man by the arm. Then he literally picked her up and threw her over a table and across the bar. The bar manager went on to describe Christina as a mess who had a reputation around town for acting out of control when under the influence of alcohol. He said she was flagged from every single bar in town. Christina was known for her anger, drinking, and bizarre behavior. Whenever she'd come to a bar, whoever she was with promised to keep her in line. Well, that never happened. Christina never went out without having an argument or fight with someone. Another account I read stated that Christina may have been somewhat controversial in her personal life, but she always made sure that didn't interfere with her professional life. And that part does appear to be true, judging by her success. It's also been alleged that Christina was spotted in the lobby of her apartment building at 6.30 a.m., just four days before her death, stumbling and unable to walk. Again, take this with a grain of salt, but there does seem to be a pattern of Christina drinking too much and getting out of control. This could explain how she came to make some unfortunate decisions while intoxicated that may have been out of character for her when she was sober. Though that certainly doesn't mean that she's to blame for anything that happened to her from this point on. Let's be perfectly clear about that. That blame lies solely on the men who made the decision to take advantage of her intoxication, one of them ultimately ending her life. Three days before Christina was murdered, she reported to the police that a man had spiked her drink at a bar. Then he'd gone home with her and robbed her, stealing some of her jewelry and designer handbags. After her death, it was suspected that perhaps the robber had returned and was responsible for both crimes. Surveillance footage taken from nearby businesses showed the male suspect leaving her building. Police managed to track down some of Christina's stolen handbags and jewelry in West Philadelphia, and the burglar was ultimately determined to be a man named Andre Melton. He was later found guilty of burglary, criminal trespassing, theft by unlawful taking, and receiving stolen property, but this was, surprisingly, completely unrelated to her murder. This brings us to the night that 36-year-old Christina's life was brutally taken from her, when she tragically crossed paths with a 30-year-old man named Jonathan Harris. Security camera footage showed that just after 2 a.m. on August 22, 2018, Christina took a Lyft rideshare into downtown Philadelphia and met Harris outside of a pizza shop on 13th Street. Further footage showed that they walked together for about 15 minutes, sometimes arm in arm. Later, more camera footage showed Christina and Harris arriving at her home in another Lyft vehicle. Andrew Sanford, the driver of that Lyft, later testified that Christina had flagged him down and begged him for a ride, claiming she'd been harassed on the street by several men and that she wanted to get home safely. She told Mr. Sanford that Harris had helped protect her from the harassment. Mr. Sanford agreed to drive her home and she pulled Harris into the car with her. Once inside the vehicle, Christina and Harris were, in Sanford's words, affectionate, with Christina even kissing Harris and seemingly initiating most of the contact. Mr. Sanford said Harris was quiet during the drive, and Christina seemed to have a happy-go-lucky attitude. He said, I figured she'd just gotten done partying and wanted to go home with him and do whatever they planned on doing together. When they reached Christina's condo building, he said Christina rushed inside, saying she had to use the bathroom. Harris then offered the driver $100 to wait outside, saying he didn't plan to stay long and would be back for a ride in 10 or 15 minutes. Harris and Sanford exchanged phone numbers. 
After 20 minutes of waiting, Sanford called Harris, and the call went to voicemail, so he left. The cameras never showed Harris leaving Christina's condo. At 9.15 p.m. that same day, police received a call from Christina's fiancé, Alex, asking them to come to the condo to do a wellness check. He'd arrived at the condo and couldn't get inside. The door was deadbolted from the inside so his key didn't work. Christina also wasn't answering her phone. Alex was very concerned. When police entered the condo, they found Christina's body on her bed, covered with a blanket. She had a broken nose and blackened eyes. She'd been severely beaten. Khalil Wardak, the medical examiner who performed Christina's autopsy, determined that her cause of death was ligature strangulation, most likely with a pair of green sweatpants that investigators had found at the crime scene. Wardak testified that the numerous injuries to Christina's body included neck fractures that would have required more than 33 pounds of pressure to inflict. Toxicology reports showed that Christina had no illegal substances in her body at the time of her death. There were also no illegal drugs found at her home. She did test positive for alcohol with a blood alcohol content of 0.252%, which is three times the legal limit for driving. Because of her work with Playboy, news of Christina's death quickly made headlines, and Jonathan Harris went on the run. Several tip-offs led the police to suspect Harris, who'd been released from prison only a month earlier after doing time for armed robbery. In the early hours of August 22nd, he'd even messaged the friend to say that he'd just met a sexy woman and that he was at her house. Harris fled across state. A week later, he was finally apprehended as he was getting off a bus in Pittsburgh. When questioned, Harris didn't deny going back to Christina's condo with her. He said he'd met her and she'd invited him back. He said they'd drunk some wine, had done some cocaine, and had consensual sex, and then he'd left. When police pointed out the inconsistencies between his story and the evidence, he suddenly gave a different version of events. Harris then said that he did go home with Christina, drank wine, and had consensual sex, but then there was an altercation. He claimed he'd brought an ounce of cocaine, which Christina wanted, but she'd refused to pay the $1,200 for it, saying she didn't owe him anything because she'd just had sex with him. He said they argued, and Christina hit him on the ear with a wine bottle. In retaliation, he slapped her in the face, and she fell to the floor. It was noted that there were no injuries to the side of Harris's head when he was arrested. He then says he carried Christina to her bed and bound her hands so she'd stop hitting him. Then he punched her in the face, again claiming this was because she refused to pay for the cocaine. Harris confessed that when Christina attempted to call 911, he began choking her. He said, I panicked, I was scared, I didn't know what to do. Harris said that once Christina was unconscious, he covered her with the blanket. Then he'd fled through the back door of the first floor apartment at around 5 a.m., jumping from the balcony. After his confession to police, he said, I never meant for this girl to die. When I left the apartment, she was not dead. I would do anything to take this back. But during Harris's trial, a man named Brandon Pearson testified that while he shared a hospital room with Harris in the days following the murder, Harris had told him that there's nothing like squeezing somebody and feeling the last breath leave their body. Harris's defense was that he was high out of his mind on cocaine, marijuana, and ketamine at the time of the killing and didn't know what he was doing, nor did he realize Christina was dead when he left her. The defense claimed everything was done out of panic. Though Harris refused to testify and no witnesses were called on behalf of the defense, Christina's family and the jury heard the horrific details of Christina's final moments through Harris's recorded confession and medical examiner Wardak's testimony. On the recording, Jonathan admitted that he'd left Christina so battered, even he couldn't look at her after what he'd done. He said, I covered her with a blanket because I didn't want to see her like that. I knew she was hurt really bad. Though Harris pled not guilty of murdering Christina and his attorneys requested a lesser charge, the jury ultimately found him guilty of first-degree murder after five hours of deliberation. He was also found guilty of kidnapping, possession of an instrument of a crime, and strangulation. As he left the courtroom, Harris told reporters that he felt that justice was served. 
At his sentencing, Harris expressed his deepest condolences and blamed his actions on his drug use. He said, I'm not looking for sympathy or making a plea for my life. I'm standing here taking responsibility for the things I've done, and I'm willing to accept the punishment, even if it's death. I cannot bring this person back. I cannot change the way you view me, but this was never my intention. Harris was given the automatic punishment of life in prison without the chance of parole, with an additional 22 and a half to 45 years of consecutive time for the other charges. The judge said that Harris deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison and that he would send that message to governors and parole boards who might consider freeing him in the future. Christina's fiance, Alex, said that Harris had tried to slander Christina and said that during their 14-year relationship, she had never used drugs. He urged Harris to tell the truth about their encounter. Alex said, you killed a loving, generous, amazing person who was sorely missed by everyone every day. You murdered a 115-pound defenseless female. You destroyed the lives of so many people and inflicted needless pain on our family and your family. And for what? Christina's dad, Stuart, said she was the brightest light that had ever lived and that her death has had a heavy impact on his family. Christina Carlin Kraft was known to her loved ones as a kind, graceful animal lover who always made time for her friends and family. They said Christina was an absolute light in this world that had been snuffed out. Christina was buried in a white coffin surrounded by beautiful flowers. Both of the women I've discussed today were successful, ambitious, and loved dearly by their families, and their lives were taken from them far too soon, devastating everyone around them. Both had left their affiliation with Playboy behind them and were on the verge of achieving their dreams, until just one senseless act of brutality ended everything. If the Playboy curse is a thing that actually exists, its cruelty knows no bounds. That's all I have for you today. I hope you found these stories interesting because there will be plenty more of the Playboy curse to come. All tragic, but some of them downright bizarre. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and bring your friends, family, COVID pod, cult members, invisible friends, or enemies. And if you have any opinions on this topic, leave them in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.